Greetings, my precious brothers and sisters. May grace and peace be multiplied unto you all from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This evening, we will not be having our regular Bible study. We will not be looking at the Epistle of Paul to the Ephesians. This evening, I just want to talk to all of us who worship at the Grace Workshop Ministries and to those who feel a spiritual connection with us. I want to talk to you from my heart and um, I'm going to use as a little guide for my talk this is where we are. This is where we are. On October 8th, we celebrated our fourth anniversary. So we are four years old. We had our first service on the 8th of October 2017 and we just want to say thanks to Almighty God for bringing us through our first four years. I know, you know, we all know that had it not been for the Lord who was on our side, then we would have been swallowed up. We give him thanks for his love, for his mercy, for his grace, for his great kindness and patience. He has continually, consistently, amazingly looked beyond our fault and he has seen our great need of him. We are so grateful to God for his goodness. I want to just express thanks to all of you, every single one of you who has been so supportive, to those who share the leadership of this ministry with me. Um, words aren't enough for me to express my appreciation to you for your support and your love. Some of you make decisions that um, are maybe too involved for my little brain to make. And a lot of the burden of this work is yours. And I just want to thank you. I'm not going to call any names this evening, but you know who you are. I want to thank the young men and young women who have helped me so tremendously with the ministry of the word during these four years. We've really um, seen the development of our young people in terms of the ministry of the word when we think about our series show the body to the body when we looked at the seven churches in Asia, when we looked at that subject of the great shepherd, the good shepherd, we were so tremendously blessed by the ministry of our, of our fellow servants in the work of the gospel. I want to say thanks to you. You know what? I just want to say a big thanks to um, those who have been so faithful in their giving in a very difficult time. Um, we haven't said much about it, brothers and sisters, but um, you know, it has been difficult for us to operate over the last year and a half. We have had our struggles, but had it not been for your faithfulness, it would have been so much worse. Thank you so much. 
and some of you have given sacrificially even in the pandemic when every cent really counted we thank you so very much it's it's just a blessing to see god's people rallying to the cause under pressure um uh, you know, over the past 18 months, as I have said, our lives have been significantly altered as a result of the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. We have seen illnesses, social isolation, job losses, financial hardships, death, and with the death there has been grief and loss and trauma these are just a few of the presenting challenges that have affected us both personally and as a church family we have all been deeply impacted our nation has been impacted and uh, brothers and sisters, I don't know if we'll ever come back to what we used to consider, you know, to be what was normal. Um, I think some things have changed forever. And I do hope that we as a church are learning the lessons. And I do hope that you understand that there are some things that will never be the same again. We have learned that we don't have to have long drawn out services. We have learned that God can minister effectively in short services. And um, I don't know if we'll ever go back to having the long services that we used to have. May I just pause to say this? Our ministry has been so positively impacted by persons who participate overseas. Some of them are pastors and pastors' wives. Some of them are just ordinary members of churches. Some of them are persons that we have never met. Some of them are old friends and acquaintances. They have been praying for us. They have been so supportive of us during the pandemic they have gone i would say the extra mile more than the extra mile to be supportive they have sent supplies for our children they have made financial contributions and i just want to let you know those of you who live overseas who participate we are so grateful there are times when I am tempted to call names, but I know that you probably wouldn't want that. And so I refrain, but we just wouldn't be where we are now had it not been for you. I, I just want to kind of, kind of locate us this evening to talk to us about where we are as an assembly that is four years old. First, I'd just like to talk to you about two exciting new ministries that, um, well, one of them has already come on stream and one of them is in embryo, but will soon be born, so to speak. I want to mention the Grace Member Care Ministry. Um, this is really a ministry with a lot of potential. When we, when we thought about how to effectively minister, minister to our membership, one of the things we said is that, you know, in a church that is of, you know, any, any size, it's not difficult for some members to fall through the cracks. And we, just said we want to eliminate that completely i'm not saying that people people won't be won't become you know disheartened and disappointed and may even stop coming to the church but when that happens we must know why we must know what is happening to our members 
So the church is more than a building, eh? It is a group of redeemed people comprising the body of Christ. It is our desire as an assembly to minister effectively to every person who worships with us. Hence, the Grace Member Care Ministry. The purpose of the ministry is to enable each member of the Grace Workshop Ministries to experience the compassionate care of the Lord Jesus Christ by intentionally and strategically keeping our church family connected in meaningful ways by one, ensuring that each member receives timely support in their hour of need or in their hour of triumph, and two, providing each member with opportunities to develop spiritually through serving others and so fulfill their God-given purpose. The Grace Member Care Ministry was officially launched in the month of August 2021. To achieve the goal of building meaningful relationships and serving the needs of our over 600 registered members, 12 cell groups have been formed. Each member has been assigned to the group that is their birth month. Each of the groups is staffed by a cell group leader and two assistants, and they have the responsibility of of ensuring that no member feels neglected or abandoned. The first official rollout of the ministry took place in the month of September. Approximately 450 members were contacted by phone and 20 members received financial assistance and our care packages. There are about 15 persons who make regular donations to the ministry in both cash and kind. And wow, these people are so faithful and we are so grateful to them. To ensure the equitable distribution of the resources received, a team has been, has been put in place to perform the relevant administrative functions. And all Grace Member Care Ministry team members are currently engaged in a ministry-related training program. And so we believe that this ministry has a lot of potential. And some of you who are hearing me this evening have already been touched by this ministry. The other ministry I want to talk about is our Sunday School Stroke Youth Ministry. Um, again, this is something that we looked at and, um, you know, I think I have to take a lot of the blame for us not being on the cutting edge of this. We just um, were slow off the mark in dealing with this, but we really feel that um, we at the Grace Workshop Ministries need to develop a really powerful, as I said, cutting edge um, children and youth ministry. We need to do that. We have to have the best youth, youth and children's ministry that is possible to have. So I want to report to you that a team consisting of 10 persons have been asked to plan and implement a program of discipleship of our children and young people or preteens and teens and this team is being led by Brother Nathan Thomas. Their goal is to prepare a program and curriculum that will edify and equip our children, our young people to, to navigate the challenges in this postmodern world. In order to fulfill this mandate, the program aims to engage our children and our young people as well as to empower their parents or guardians to lead in the process of discipleship. The team believes that our children and our young people need the support of their parents or our guardians in learning and affirming biblical truths. 
Within the near future, the objective is to recruit suitable persons from our assembly who are willing to be trained as teachers and facilitators to disciple our children and young people. And we propose to start this program by January 2022. And as we said, you know, we intend to just go all the way to ensure that this ministry is properly staffed, that it is fresh, that is exciting. It is exciting. Brothers and sisters, we can't waste any more time. A friend of mine called me from overseas and he says where he lives, if a child wants to have sexual reassignment surgery, they don't even need their parents' consent. We have not reached that stage yet in this country, but it is coming and we have to instill into our children a sense of their own worth, a sense of their own value. I was so touched when I read that um, the, the gentleman, well, the man who assassinated um, Bobby Kennedy, uh, who was the Attorney General of the United States of America, um, an old minister who had left the pastorate of a church, came back to the church to preach, and he mentioned the fact that this man, this young man who had assassinated Bobby Kennedy, sat in this church, in the church that he was preaching in, as a young Sunday school boy, and the old pastor said, somebody missed him. We missed him. We can't afford to miss any of our children. None of them. So we are excited about these ministries, brethren. We do have other ministries that we plan to bring on stream, but these two ministries are kind of like our pilot projects. And we're going to not just introduce ministries for the sake of having ministries. We're going to see how these play out, how these roll out, and then we'll be able to make an assessment as to what else we need. But we want to see how these two ministries impact the lives of the members of the Grace Workshop Ministries, both our young people and our older people. Um, we just want to let you know that um, we have conducted, our HR team conducted a audit of our operations at the um, church office. And we also got an independent auditor to just review our operations. And as a result of um, those two audits, we are positioning ourselves for realignment. So we may see um, changes in our uh, structure at the um, office. And we just want to ensure that we, we make the maximum use of the resources of the persons that we do have and that we um, all work to serve the members of the Grace Workshop Ministries efficiently and effectively. So, um, you know, there may be some changes, but we'll certainly uh, let you know more about that. But we want you to know that we are conducting this realignment exercise. Also, as you know, we don't really have a formal church structure in terms of, you know, a board of elders and all of that. We really don't have any department leaders. We don't even have any departments. We have these two ministries that we mentioned to you. And uh, I might just say to us, brethren, that um, we have we have moved very slowly. You know, we don't even have a structured membership uh, policy because I personally have um, 
have been impacted by events that have been traumatic for me um, in the past and I am just wanting to be very careful how I set up any formal structures. You know, I know that, you know, we need to have them and I just want to let you know that in the coming year, we will be moving now to kind of formalize our, our structure so that um, all of us can be safeguarded by proper leadership, not just um, a pastor, but elders who serve. We have that in an informal way, but I think it's necessary to formalize that. And um, we also, I think it's important for us to have a membership policy. We have, um, we have explained, brothers and sisters, that why we are very slow in formalizing a membership policy is because we have some hard doctrinal work to do, which you know is happening now. And we said we just want people to spend some time looking at what we are saying, um, hearing what we are saying, looking at how we operate. And if, 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 if we operate in ways that you are not able to deal with, then it's not too difficult for you to leave. There is nothing tying you um, to the Grace Workshop. No, there is no membership covenant. There is no agreement. So, you know, and we did that deliberately because we don't want to tie anybody in. Uh, we want you to, 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 to see where we are going, to understand that, you know, it is not the same as where we are coming from. And we did say from the very start that it would not be the same. I don't know if we were believed, but we never pulled the wool over anybody's eyes. We were very clear from the outset that we weren't going to be operating in the same way. But we do understand the need for formal structures and so we are giving thought to it and um, I would almost want to say definitely in the new year these are things that we will move to address. I also want to let you know that in the first quarter of next year we will be uh, meeting as an assembly and um, we will be looking at our finances in a in a uh, detailed way, you know, we want to have that ready for you so that we can present to you our financial statement audited, of course, so that you can know exactly where we are. Now, um, let me just talk to you, as I said, I'm going to talk to you from my heart. Um, you know, we, 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 the Grace Workshop ministry started, I would say, in a unique way. Um, as I have said before, I, I am not the one who started the ministry in a, in a real sense. <laughs> I was asked to attend a meeting that would have been held on the Sunday following our departure from where we were before. I was invited to attend the meeting and, um, you know, everything evolved from that. Um, and when I said we started in a unique way, you know, of course, we weren't the first to have left the organization that we were a part of, but not many groups have left because of doctrinal issues. Now, certainly there were other issues which may or may not have been even more important than the doctrinal ones, but there were some doctrinal differences and we parted company. So we our leaving was unique in that, you know, we did have issues with what was previously believed and taught. 
and and that has caused us now to evolve to where we are now and that's why i say this little talk is we 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 call it this is where we are because one of the benefits brethren of being apart is that we have the freedom to study the scriptures without feeling that um, anybody's looking over our shoulders and policing our thinking so so we have been able to explore the scriptures as the word of god for all people not as a manual for a certain denomination some of the things that we have been teaching about were never taught about are not very much great doctrines of the bible we knew nothing about systematic theology or what we knew of theology was really a a book of Acts theology, primarily a book of Acts theology. And if we are honest, we will all admit that. We, we, you could go to Bible school and never explore the book of Romans, the book of Ephesians, two of the greatest doctrinal books of the Bible. Um, subjects like the atonement, the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of, of redemption, just were never really considered in any detail. And so these are things that we are dealing with now, brethren, and we make no apology for delving into these things. And... Um, some of the things that we teach are controversial and I am amused when I hear comments about teaching new doctrine. There is nothing that we are teaching that is new. It may be new to some people. It was not new to Paul. It was not new to Augustine. It was not new to Athanasius. It was not new to Luther, it was not new to Calvin, it was not new to Knox, it was not new to Warfield, it was not new to Jonathan Edwards, some of the greatest theologians of all time, admitted as the greatest theologians, even by persons who do not subscribe to their views. There is nothing that we are teaching that is new in the sense of being biblically new. It is new to persons who have never delved into them and that is why it is startling and shocking to some people because their theology has never gone beyond the book of Acts. We are taking the Bible far more seriously, brothers and sisters. And as I said, you know, I'm speaking as honestly as I can. I'm trying to speak as modestly as I can, but I'm trying to speak as honestly as I can. Um, so, so we are dealing with critical doctrinal issues and we're going to continue to do that. We're not afraid to deal with the hard issues. And, um, you know, when we were able to meet um, in an in-person service, you knew that recently we had started to have question and answer sessions after every service. That's no longer the case because we have to meet virtually, but we do plan to have a question and answer period coming up very shortly, maybe in another two weeks. I think we probably use one Sunday evening just to have a question and answer session over Zoom where you we'll be able to ask your questions and we'll try and answer. And brethren, we have no problem at all in admitting when we do not have the answers. We will take the questions. Those that we cannot answer, we'll do our research and come back and answer. We don't have no problem now saying that there are some questions that we can't answer. And there are some questions that may never be answered 
to everybody's satisfaction. But we want you to know that we are committed to feedback and so we want, if you have a question about anything that we have been teaching recently, we want you to feel free to ask that question. Let me just say a couple more things. Well, a little more than a couple more things. I believe that we who worship at the Grace Workshop Ministries are learning to grapple with the concepts of what I refer to as intense Christianity. You may have heard me using that phrase quite often. Slowly, but surely, I think we are understanding that genuine biblical change is impossible if our minds are not critically engaged and renewed. I think we are slowly but surely coming to grips with the fact that conversion is a crisis that leads to a process. Through Christ and in Christ, we have once and for all been given a new position in his new creation. But day by day, it is our responsibility to appropriate what he has given us by faith. I think we are beginning to appreciate that it is the word of God that renews our mind as we surrender to the sweet influences of the Holy Spirit. As our minds grasp the truth of God's word, they are gradually transformed by the Spirit and this renewal leads to a changed lifestyle. I think we are learning that God reasons with us through the truths of his word. He says to us, come now and let us reason together. The doctrines of scripture make sense because they are God's truth. When the spirit of God opens a person's mind to the truth revealed in the word, the truth will result in changed emotions and changed wills. Any change that bypasses the mind will not last. See, these high-octane services, um, many times they don't lead to any lasting change. We are committed to change that comes by hearing the word, assimilating the word, um, and applying the word. As an assembly, we are gradually renouncing a works-based, feeling-oriented, emotionally-driven brand of Christianity, and we are embracing a brand of Christianity that is rooted in the Holy Scriptures, grace-based and truly spiritual. Less and less are we trying to manipulate the anointing in our services, the anointing in our services, in order to create an appropriate spiritual climate. So we are no longer begging people to worship. We are no longer making God look like a pauper. You know, we are no longer putting people on a guilt trip if the service doesn't go a certain way. Um, we encourage people to worship and we leave it at that. We no longer are trying to say, let us say hallelujah seven times and let us call the name of Jesus seven times and all that sort of thing to create an emotion. We're not in that any, any, any longer. And um, brethren, let me just say, let me just say, well, let me hold that for a little later. We are gradually abandoning our efforts to come across as deep and spiritual by speaking Christianese. We are eliminating phrases such as I decree and declare. 
I speak a word into the atmosphere. You know, your word has creative power. And I summon Michael and Gabriel and other warring angels and similar utterances which sound impressive, which sound deep, which sound profound, but in reality they are unscriptural and inane. We are deliberately and intentionally making an effort to ensure that our services are characterized by what I would call a godly symmetry that harmonizes every part of the service with the service as a whole. The songs, the scriptures, the testimonies dovetail into the message and the message is the high point of the service. We don't have any services where, where the service was so great that you didn't need the word to be preached. The word which God says he has ordained as the means by which people are saved. We don't have any services where the word is not important. The songs, you know, we are, we are trying to be careful in our song selection so that we sing songs in our services that are doctrinally sound. We are eliminating unscriptural and silly nonsense, feel-good songs that do not glorify God, but glorify the flesh instead. And I've spoken about this ad nauseum. I don't want to get into it again. In short, we are endeavoring to magnify maturity over manifestation and soundness over sensationalism so brothers and sisters we are not into the business of telling people to stand up and telling them that their chair is anointed and we dare them to sit down on their chair and then group psychology causes everybody to fall on the ground because nobody wants to appear as if something hasn't happened to them when they sit down on a red hot chair we are not that kind of church and let me just say here, brethren, if that is the kind of church that you want, you are not going to be comfortable in the Grace Workshop Ministries. I just need to tell you plainly, at least not while I am the pastor. That's not the kind of church we are involved in. And I doubt if we will ever be that kind of church again. Will we have services where we can feel the presence of God? I'm very sure of that. Will God be able to speak to us through his word? He certainly will be able to. Will we have services where we worship God freely and exuberantly? Yes, we will. But we are not into the gimmicks, brethren. We just not. This, this, we, we don't have services where people come and perform and show off their spiritual prowess and their gifts. We are just not that type of church. So you might want to rethink. If that is what you want, you might want to rethink your association with the Grace Workshop Ministries. Brothers and sisters, let me say this. The truth is that not everything in Scripture is equally plain. And we are having to grapple with that now. Scripture interprets Scripture. We understand the meaning of the whole of Scripture by studying its parts. And we learn the meaning of its parts by studying the whole. We interpret the more difficult passages of Scripture in the light of the clearer passages of Scripture, and not vice versa. There is a unity that is inherent in the Bible that is not imposed from the outside. We must... <laughs> You know, you know, brethren, we, we don't have to try to, to force the pieces to fit. Once you understand election, you see it all through the Bible. Cain and Abel, Ishmael and Isaac, 
Ishan Jacob, it's all and all in almost everything God does. And, and you'll see it very clearly once you understand that there's unity that is in, inherent in the Bible. This idea that God saved Old Testament people different from New Testament people is not scriptural, brethren. God has only saved persons one way, that is by grace, through faith in Christ Jesus. Um, we don't need to force the pieces to fit. All of the Bible belongs to all of us. There are no verses or passages in Scripture that belong to some denominations and not others. All the verses and passages in the Bible are God's verses and passages, and therefore all of them belong to all of God's people. All of them fit together into a consistent whole because according to 1 Corinthians 14, 33, God is not the author of confusion. As we said earlier, Scripture interprets Scripture. And if we feel compelled to embrace some verses or passages and disregard others in order to maintain consistency, we have not really understood the verses or passages that we claim to embrace. We may initially find the diversity of the Bible puzzling. We may wonder how Leviticus relates to Luke, how First Chronicles relates to First Corinthians, and how Esther relates to Ephesians. We may ask, what is the thread that holds together all of the different books of the Bible. Brothers and sisters, the thread that holds all of the different books of the Bible together is Jesus Christ. Christ is the unifying message from Genesis to Revelation. The Bible is a Jesus narrative from page 1 to page whatever page your Bible ends. It's all about Jesus. When we read the Bible, we must always read it in the light of its main plot. And its main plot is Jesus Christ. It is only when we do so that things fall into place behind every story, every law, Every proverb, every prophecy, and every exhortation is the unfolding mystery of Christ and his redemptive work. Here at the Grace Workshop Ministries, I'm just telling you what our philosophy is. I'm just telling you what we do here, brothers and sisters, because you need to make up your mind, eh? Here we are committed to biblical preaching and teaching. We stand firmly on the principle of sola scriptura, or scripture alone. We believe that it is the primary mandate of the minister of the word to preach and teach God's word. He or she is not merely to preach or teach about the Bible, but to expound the very text of scripture using the very language of scripture one of the things that changed my my whole preaching and teaching brethren is one is a good friend of mine who is known to you who said to me one day reverend don't be afraid to use the language of scripture if the bible says god sent his son don't Try to make that sound like God, that Christ sent himself. The Bible says God sent his son. You say that. God sent his son made of a woman made under the law. Just say what the Bible says. We must use the language of scripture. Any preaching or teaching that does not find its foundation in the Bible is utterly futile. No matter how anointed stimulating, exciting, and or inspiring it may seem to be. Why are some denominations afraid 
to use the language of the Bible? Why are they afraid to read certain passages? Expository preaching and teaching, which is what we are trying to do, involve the exposition or comprehensive explanation of the scriptures. It is preaching and teaching that presents the meaning and intent of a biblical text, providing commentary and examples to make the passage clear and understandable. The word exposition is related to the word expose. The expository preacher's goal is simply to expose the meaning of the Bible verse by verse. As a method, expository preaching and teaching differs from topical preaching and teaching. To prepare a topical sermon, the preacher starts with a topic and then finds a passage or passages in the Bible that address that topic. The passages are not usually studied in depth. Instead, each passage is used to support the topic. In expository preaching and teaching, on the other hand, the Bible passage is the topic, and support materials are used to explain and clarify it. In expository preaching and teaching, the minister starts his or her preparation with a passage of scripture and then studies the grammar, the context, and the historical setting of that passage in order to understand the author's intent. In other words, the expositor is also an exegete, and exegete is one who analyzes the text carefully and objectively once the minister understands the meaning of the passage, he or she then prepares a sermon to explain and apply it. The result is expository preaching or teaching. Brothers and sisters, when you teach in this way, it helps both you, the teacher, and the listeners. The teacher is helped because, for instance, we are now teaching through the book of Ephesians, going verse by verse. There is no way. You know if you are thinking ahead. You know which verse we are going to be dealing with. You know if you can be conscious, you are aware if I try to avoid a difficult passage, a passage that presents dilemmas that is not easy to interpret. You know if I try to bypass it, I have to confront it honestly. You see? And, and, and brethren, let me just say that my allegiance primarily is to the word of the Lord. My life and some of your lives could have been way easier if we had been willing to just accept the status quo to look beyond the questions that we were seeing in the books of the Bible and just trying to blind our minds to say, well, you know, we have questions, but let's leave them in the background. We can't do that. I can't do that, brethren. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't do that. I have to be honest with the text and as thorough as I can be. Now, I'm not saying that expository preaching and teaching is the only valid mode of preaching and teaching. I, I'm not saying it is the only valid mode. What I'm saying is that I think it is the best mode for teaching the plain sense of the Bible. Expositors usually approach scripture with these assumptions. When I teach, when I approach scripture, these are my assumptions. The Bible is God's word, number one. If every word of God is true and pure, then every word deserves to be examined and understood. Every word. Two, another assumption is divine wisdom is needed to understand the word. So, you know, I can, I can interpret scripture using my own mind, which would not be helpful to you because my mind is not the greatest. 
So I have to depend on the illumination of the Holy Spirit. I have to depend on my study of the context, of the grammar, of the meaning of words in the Greek, of the commentaries of men whose minds are sharper than mine and who have honestly and carefully tried to study passages that give me trouble. Three, another assumption, the minister, the preacher, the teacher is subject to the text, not the other way around. See, the, the Bible is not subject to me. I am subject to the word. Scripture is the authority and its message must be presented honestly apart from personal bias. See, brethren, I hear some people saying, oh, you don't believe in this anymore. You don't believe in that anymore. I am a little impatient with that kind of approach. Tell me that what I am teaching or preaching is unscriptural or unsound. Don't tell me that, you know, you are upset because I seem to be teaching that your little pet subject that you have believed all these years may not mean what you thought it mean. It meant, I understand the pain and the angst. I've told you that I've been through it my own self when God started to deal with me. But, but brethren, it is more important for me to, to teach truth. So, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm saying that we at the Grace Workshop need to be like the Bereans. See, when Paul usually went to cities where there were, was a Rome, where there was a Jewish synagogue, he would go there first and he would teach and he would invariably meet with opposition. It was not that they could refute what he was saying, but what he was teaching was so different and opposed to what they believed that they usually resorted to violence to stop him. But the Bereans, when he went to, Ber to Berea, the Berean Jews who were familiar with the Old Testament scriptures said, we are going home to study. We hear what you have said, Paul, and we are going to study from our Old Testament scrolls what you have said. And when they did that, they believed, even though what Paul was saying oppose what they had believed for many years. They didn't just resort to violence and say, you don't believe in this anymore. No, they went home and studied and God opened their understanding because they were honest. See, they weren't hiding behind tradition. They were honest. The fourth assumption, the minister's responsibility is to clarify the text and call for a corresponding response from his or her hearers. The expositor cares little or nothing at all if his or her audience is impressed by his or her style. What he or she truly desires is for the audience to understand what the text means and therefore what God requires of them. And now I want to turn, this is the final thing I'll talk about, you know, based on recent events in St. James. You know, brethren, these kind of things happen when people uh, people are not scripturally sound. Things like these don't happen in a church that is scripturally sound. When we are emotionally driven and love hype and manifestations, and we're not sound scripturally, these kind of things happen. I want to just and I, I'm not addressing that incident directly, but I just think there are some things I need to say to us. 
in chapter one of their book, The Subtle Power of Spiritual Abuse, which is a book that I would recommend that as many of us as possible buy, especially especially coming from where many of us are coming from. The subtle power of spiritual abuse. You see, brethren, here's the thing. What happened in that church in St. James is bizarre. You know, it's crazy. It's, it's way beyond anything that we could have dreamed of. But, but there are subtler forms of spiritual abuse that take place. Which, which are the precursors for what we saw in St. James. In chapter one of their book, The Subtle Power of Spiritual Abuse, David Johnson and Jeff Van Vonderen define spiritual abuse in the following way. Hear me now. Spiritual abuse is the mistreatment of a person who is in need of help support or greater spiritual empowerment with the result of weakening, undermining, or decreasing that person's spiritual empowerment. They go on to say that spiritual abuse can occur when a leader uses his or her spiritual position to control or dominate another person. It often involves overriding the feelings and opinions of another without regard to what will result in the other person's state of living, emotions, or spiritual well-being. In this application, power is used to bolster the position or needs of a leader over and above one who comes to them in need. Spiritual abuse can also occur when spirituality is used to make people live up to a spiritual standard. This promotes external spiritual performance, also without regard to an individual's actual well-being or is used as a means of proving a person's spirituality. So the way, the way for instance, you wear your hair is used to prove whether you are spiritual or not. The hat that you wear depending on the type of hat that you wear, that can be used to judge how spiritual you are. Whatever the case, the results of spiritual abuse are usually the same. The individual is left bearing a weight of guilt, judgment or condemnation and confusion about their worth and standing as a Christian. See, brethren, you don't have to be in a church like the one that was recently in the news in St. James. Many of our churches, and brethren, I um, I will carry this to my grave, that I was also a part of this kind of system, a system that sought to control members, to the point where everybody had to look the same way and almost act the same way. I have to carry that pain with me to the grave or to the rapture. I am, I am believing God that his word is true, that the former things will not be remembered. Um, so it's, it's, it's terribly guilt and judgment and condemnation and confusion that that have been heaped upon persons who just wanted to love the Lord, but maybe had an independent mind, just a different hairstyle, and they were moved from their offices. They couldn't serve. 
It's very painful. And maybe, maybe you don't like to hear me talk about it. But brethren, I need to tell you that some of these spiritual abusive behaviors take place in churches that may not go to the extent of the church that is recently in the news. And, and then, brothers and sisters, I know this is difficult for you to grapple with, but let me say, I want you to do your own homework and see when most of these cases occur, like the one in St. James, although this one is really way outside of what we have ever grappled with before or that I have known about. But, but I want you to look at the origins of the leaders of these churches. What are their spiritual roots? And do your own homework. I, I don't need to tell you. you. You do your own work. Later on in the same chapter, Johnson and Von Vonderen say, for those who discover they have built a system, they have built a system that's spiritually abusive, enslaving people to a system, enslaving people to a system, enslaving people to a system, a leader, a standard of performance. We have some advice and guidance that can help you change and return to grace. And for those who discover they have been stuck in an abusive, enslaving system, we offer advice and guidance on how to make changes that will bring you back to the freedom that's in Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Galatians 5.1 NIV, and here Paul is talking, the yoke of slavery he's talking about is the standards of men. And also, um, 1 Corinthians 7.23, again from the NIV, you were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. At the root of it all, we may find that too many today have forgotten the incredible price that was paid in blood for our freedom in Christ. For we have been called to a spiritual life built upon the free gift of God's grace. Ephesians 2, 8-9 The works we are to do are only those that our God and Father prepared for us. Verse 10 it is God alone whom we will answer for what we have done in his name and what we fail to do. Matthew 25. Now, I'm going to end, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to now play a clip. And this clip is um, Pastor John MacArthur responding to a question from uh, a lady who was in the audience at his church one day. And she asked a question about the pastor's authority. And I want you to listen to his answer. It's about, it's less than four minutes. But every word he says is cogent. And I totally, I fully endorse what he has to say. After you listen to this clip, we'll come with some closing remarks. My name is Heather. Hi, Heather. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for your ministry. God has used your online broadcast very much over the last couple of years in my life, in my family's life. Good. Um, one question I struggle with, though, is to what extent um, a member of a church is required to obey his pastor? How much authority does a pastor have in the lives of his congregants? Um, none. No authority. Um, I have no authority in this church, personally. My experience doesn't give me any authority. My knowledge doesn't give me any authority. My education doesn't give me any authority. Um, I have no authority. My position doesn't give me any authority. My title doesn't give me any authority. That's why I don't like titles. 
Only the Word of God has authority. Christ is the head of the church, and He mediates His rule in the church through His Word. I have no authority. I don't have authority beyond the Scripture. I can never exceed what is written, 1 Corinthians 4, 6. To do that is to become, Paul says, arrogant and to regard yourself as superior. I have nothing to say to you that puts any demand on you if it isn't from the Word of God. Uh, and I, you're, you're probably talking out of some experience where you felt that some undue authority was exercised over you or somebody you know by a pastor. We need to be reminded that as pastors, even though the Lord has lifted us up and given us this kind of responsibility, we possess no personal authority. Um, if I am telling you what God has said in His Word, that has authority, right? But I cannot exceed what is written. I can't tell you about your life. I, I can give you wisdom if you ask, I, but I may have no more wisdom than somebody else. Um, you, you would get more wisdom on many, many issues out of my beloved Patricia on things than you would get out of me. But she's not in the pulpit. But she has spiritual insight and spiritual wisdom. And if you ask for advice or wisdom, hers in many cases would exceed mine. So the pastor in himself has no authority. Listen to what Paul says. Who is Paul? Who is Apollos? Who is Cephas? We're nothing. It's all of Christ, it's all of the Holy Spirit, it's all of the Scripture, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Heather. So, brothers and sisters, I hope you, you listen to that very carefully. I just want to say that is my ministry philosophy. I have many faults. You know that. You know I'm far from perfect. But one of the faults I don't have is... I'm not a control freak. I have no desire to micromanage anybody's life. My responsibility is to feed the flock of God. I, I have no desire to control anybody's life. And as Pastor MacArthur says, my authority begins and ends with the word. So brethren, um, that concludes my little talk with you this evening. Um, I just thought I'd take the time out, you know, now that it's our for fourth anniversary, just to talk to you from my heart. Um, and I ask you, brethren, it's, uh, there, you know, I have a little concern. I, I, I'm not sure we are listening to the Word of God very carefully. I just think we are reacting emotionally, and I don't think we are processing what we are hearing. And I, I think that you will find that many of the questions that are being asked have been answered in even the, the series before this, by faith alone. Just, just go back. I, I'm, I'm not promoting my own messages, but just go back and listen. Some of the questions you are having on baptism were dealt with in that, in that, um, in that <laughs> series. But, but, but anyhow, we, 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 as I said, we're going to have this question and answer session, and we want you to feel free to ask your questions. In fact, you could send your questions into our media team so that we can look at them beforehand. But brethren, God bless you. I, I want to say thanks again to you. I know that, I know that some per, persons, persons are at the Grace Workshop Ministries for different reasons. Um, different reasons, we, we are aware of that. And, um, Numbers don't mean as much to us as they used to four years ago, 
you know it is it doesn't scare us or impress us in any way not at all what we are interested in is raising up a group of people who love the word the unadulterated word who are not afraid to investigate everything that they have believed and taught and as we have said many times if if you are afraid to put what you have been taught and believed under the microscope then that tells me you are not very sure that what you believe is the truth because anything that i believe i am willing to put it under the microscope and i'm willing to change if the weight of scriptural evidence points me to change it it may be very painful for me but uh, my my conscience is is as martin luther king martin luther the reformer says my conscience is 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 subject to the word of god and the word of god is what i mean nothing else subpoenas my conscience to appear before the supreme court of heaven tradition can't do that but the word of god has the power to get me to change may god richly bless you brothers and sisters we can honestly say that we love you we thank god for you and we we hope that god will continue to pour out his abundant blessings on you in the name of jesus christ god bless you